Here's an idea. PBS Idea Channel is unique among YouTube critics because its takes are not served hot. After five jam-packed years, PBS Idea Channel, written and hosted by Mike Rugnetta, is coming to an end. Beginning in 2012, the series, one of several YouTube channels distributed by PBS Digital Studios, has delved into internet and pop culture phenomena through the lens of philosophy and critical theory, and has delved into critical theory and philosophy by way of internet and pop culture phenomena. It's a both-and kind of thing. On the face of it, PBS IT channel's form with its vlog post video essay format and its catchy counterintuitive titles looks perhaps like the noblest platonic form of the hottest of hot takery machines. But actually, I think Idea Channel is really an answer to the hot take. But what is a hot take? Put simply, we could say a take is just an opinion, specifically an internet opinion. But a hot take is more than just any old internet opinion. Writing for Jezebel, Gia Tolentino gives two criteria for the hot take. First, she says, a hot take is primarily gestural. Like striking a pose, a hot take is ephemeral in that it passes quickly from view while still conveying a message, even if that message isn't anything really beyond the existence of its own hot takey self. Second, Tolentino says that a hot take is based on reaction, specifically, quote, the idea that a reaction is worth paying attention to for its own sake, simply because it exists. This need to react connects with John Herman's argument in a piece for the all, that hot takes, quote, represent the we should have something on this news impulse, stripped to its barest form, left unspoken, and carried out as a matter of course. Herman also describes the hot take as a response to an enormous surplus of available attention, otherwise known as the internet, which means that the hot take might just be the form par excellence of content, 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 yar, content. This becomes especially obvious when the so-called take cycle reaches the point of take inception, when there are not only hot takes about some pseudo-newsy thing in the world, but then you have hot takes about those hot takes, and then meta hot takes about all these your hot takes these days. Like Mike has said on Idea Channel talking about content. While not all consumed things are content, there is a weird and I think correct implication that all content is consumed. So it seems to me like you could read the hot take as sort of meta-consumptive. Hot takes consume in order to be consumed. They appropriate and digest a thing so that they can be in turn appropriated and digested, taken up into an ever-expanding circulation of spectacles. As Herman dramatizes it, if we acknowledge the object, people will acknowledge us. Uh, but the object, it just is. No, you must harness it. You must find a way to turn your gaze into a take. So all this sort of takes account of the hot in hot takes, but what about the take in hot takes? Hot takes may be a lot of things, or no thing at all, but if hot takes are anything, they are negative. A take tends to negate either by surprise, as in, you thought X, but you'd be wrong, or by actually moralizing about it, as in, this is bad, and you and it and everyone should feel bad too. Elspeth Reeve argues that a true hot take is a piece of opinion journalism hastily written in a scolding tone, often by older men who've achieved enough status in media that they don't have to work so hard anymore. There's a just telling it like it is attitude, even if, according to the best available data, it is not like that at all. She also quotes Simon Malloy's definition of a hot take, which is a little more democratic. That a hot take is a piece of deliberately provocative commentary that's based almost entirely on shallow moralizing. So I guess hot takes taken as a whole could mean something like what your great aunt means when she says that someone is very opinionated. But there's another word for what's going on here, and that's polemics. Coming from the Greek word meaning warlike, polemical speech is defined by its negativity. It stands against some other person, object, idea, or argument. In a 1984 interview, Michel Foucault contrasts polemics on one hand with discussion on the other as two kinds of games. The differences between them lie not just in the end goals of each, but also in how the rights slash privileges of each person or interlocutor are understood to derive. The polemicist arrives on the scene, quote, encased in privileges that he possesses in advance and will never agree to question. What are these rights? Well, for one, the right to wage a kind of discursive just war against a person or idea that deep down must be wrong and also a threat. So then, for a polemicist, Foucault argues, quote, the game consists not of recognizing this person as a subject having the right to speak, but of abolishing him as interlocutor from any possible dialogue. 
and his final objective will be not to come as close as possible to a difficult truth, but to bring about the triumph of the just cause he's been manifestly upholding from the beginning. The polemicist relies on a legitimacy that his adversary is by definition denied. Just like Tolentino says of hot takes, Foucault sees polemical speech as primarily gestural, a theater of gesticulation, he even calls it a comedy. But these mere gestures do have effects, namely sterilization. Has anyone seen a new idea come out of polemics, he says? In contrast to polemics, discussion is a shared investigation in which the interlocutors, instead of putting up conversational armaments, take risks together in what Foucault calls the serious play of questions and answers in the work of reciprocal elucidation. In discussion, the interlocutors don't bring a bunch of external rights and privileges they have to defend. Rather, Foucault says, the rights of each person arise simply from the dialogue situation itself. The person asking questions, simply by virtue of asking a question, has the right to remain unconvinced, to notice contradictions, to require more info, to point out faulty reasoning, etc. Same goes for the person answering questions. Simply by virtue of answering a question, this person is tied to the logic of their discourse, tied to what they've said up to this point, and tied to receiving more questions from the other. Discussion, unlike polemics, is about recognizing the other person as a speaking subject. Interlocutors negotiate the terms of the dialogue in order to work together in a game that is at once pleasant and difficult in order to, quote, come as close as possible to a difficult truth. This, I think, goes a long way toward understanding Idea Channel's approach to the critical examination of art, literature, philosophy, and culture through everyday phenomena. To use Foucault's words, Idea Channel is engaged in a kind of serious and not-so-serious play, a dialogue of questions and answers that work together toward reciprocal elucidation. But reciprocal for whom? Well, for one thing, the text in question. Idea Channel is in dialogue with the many texts it brings to bear. In the act of peeling back layers, it also lets the text speak. If, as writer Henry James puts it, art lives upon discussion, upon experiment, upon curiosity, upon variety of attempt, upon the exchange of views and the comparison of standpoints, then for Idea Channel, so do cultural phenomena in all their forms. But Idea Channel is also quite literally in dialogue with its audience. What do you guys think? Do you think internet memes are works of art? Let us know in the comments. Let us know in the comments, and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. As in Foucault's concept of discussion, Idea Channel's central format is that it asks questions, provides its own thoughts, puts the questions to the audience, and then responds to its thoughts. After talking about how art lives on discussion and the comparison of perspectives, Henry James writes that quote unquote, wide awake fiction refuses to apologize for itself even in the face of those who self-consciously feel the need to say that fiction is ultimately frivolous make-believe, a trifle that obviously doesn't have anything relevant to say about real life. Idea Channel 2 has faced this kind of response. Multiple times, host Mike Rugnetta has answered the question of, why you gotta overthink everything? I think that we have a fair amount of common understanding that it is useful and worthwhile um, to deepen our experience of media and culture. That that is that's a that's a familiar idea. It's one that's not doesn't have as wide a purchase as the understanding that knowing about science uh, or mathematics and all the, all those related things uh, will will deepen your experience of the world. But it is one that is familiar. I think that there is less of a widespread understanding that everyday things like uh, hotels, transportation, road trips, manufacturing, design, etc., 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 are uh, worthy of critical thinking. They repay deep thought. If you have a deep understanding of those things, if you are able to have critical thought or think deeply about them, then you can have such a deep experience of your everyday life. And man, that is so much fun, and it's really powerful. If Idea Channel is the answer to the hot take, then what should we call what it is that Idea Channel does? If what it does is unapologetically interpret meaning in the ephemera and artifacts of the everyday, committed to the risks of figuring out the rules that arise from this dialogue, this serious play with philosophy, art, and life, then why don't we call it wide awake criticism? What do you think? Has Idea Channel been the answer to the hot take that we need or the answer that we deserve? And what has Idea Channel meant to you? And why not? Let me know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. Mike, congratulations on five incredible years with this channel. Um, it's been a huge role model for me as I've started doing YouTube videos. 
In fact, it's sort of one of the big reasons that I thought of doing this in the first place. And you, dear viewer, if you, like me, are trying to continue Idea Channel's mission of critically examining our world, please subscribe to the channel.